Hello and a warm welcome. Our webinar today goes out to our customers, students, interested engineers, and last but not least, to our competition. My name is Emilio Meza, and I am your moderator for today's webinar, titled Reduced Thermal Resistance with Latest Phase Change Tim. In this webinar, Stefan Hopfe will explain the most significant properties of thermal interface material. Additionally, he will explain the support Simicron provides, such as pre-applied TIM. Before we get started with the presentation, some words about the webinar platform. In case of connection issues to the presentation stream or the sound, please try to reconnect using the button on the very top of your browser window. In your browser, on the right-hand side, you see the chat window, which you can actually hide to increase the presentation window. In case you have any comments or difficulties, please let us know via the chat. All messages are private and only we can see them. If you have any questions about the content, please mark your comments as a question with a Q&A mode button. We will try to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. And the questions we do not manage to answer today will then be answered by email during the coming days. Also, you can send us an email to webinar at semicron.com at any time, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Finally, we will also share the slides as a PDF file at the very end of the presentation. You will see the download button just below the chat window. Your presenter today is Stefan Hopfe. Stefan graduated from the Technical University of Ilmenau, joining Simicron here in Nuremberg in 2011. He is now the product manager covering Semitop and Semipont module and thermal interface materials. Enjoy the webinar. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Emilio. So let's get started. The agenda of this webinar includes the following main topics. First, I will speak about the principles of thermal interface material, how does it work, and why is it mandatory. Then an overview explaining which investigations were done, I will discuss how we compared materials in thermal measurements and power cycle tests. Finally, how we are qualifying a target material, and at the end, I will summarize my finding and draw a conclusion. Let's first have a look on the principles of TIMS. What is thermal interface materials and why is it that important? So we are talking about the material between a power, mod uh, between a, a power semiconductor module and a heatsink. A power module in operation produces a lot of power loss and thus heat. This heat must be dissipated effectively. Of the several thermal resistors connected in series through the entire module structure, the thermal interface material usually accounts for 50% the largest share. Thus, there is a potential to make the greatest improvement here. Taking a close look at this mounted module, some very small air gaps occur to the module or cooler surface roughness and bending. As air is a very bad thermal conductor, it needs, to, it needs to be replaced by a better conducting tin material. The goal is to use only enough to displace the air while maintaining metal-to-metal -metal contact where possible. In this context, the particles have a significant impact containing the surfaces properly, contacting the surfaces properly and tra transferring a high heat flux. <clears throat> When particles are uniform and large, the filling degree is limited and the distance between the module and the heatsink is high, which results in a higher thermal resistance. That is not good. Vice versa, when the particles are very small, the filling degree is higher, but the heat flux must go through many thermal interconnections between these particles. This is also not optimal. Optimal means a balanced mix of huge and small particles plus a high filling degree along with the fewest in a connection as possible between these particles. Then the next question is, which kind of tin material exists on the market? There are foils, sheets and pads in various forms which are easy to use but often lead to a higher RTH and can be quite expensive in comparison to others. A thermal paste, 
filled with metal or metal oxide particles is usually able to establish the thinnest layer, which leads to the best RTH. A disadvantage here is a higher risk of particle contamination and an accidental damage to the briobite tin pattern. I view phase change materials somewhere between. Initially and during the application process to the power module, the material has a paste-like consistency due to the wax and the solvent. But after the application and the heating process, the solvent evaporates and the material changes to a rigid state like candle wax. Once heated for the first time in the application, the wax melts and the tin fills the gaps and distributes it itself across the surface. <clears throat> Rather than applying this material yourself, Semicron offers power modules with pre-applied tin. We have two different thermal creases, namely Vaca P12 and the high performance thermal paste, and two phase change materials, HALA P8 and HALA HD. During the selection process, we offer support to select the, select the right combination for each application. Our modules are printed on a full automated printing line in a clean room environment to guarantee a stable and high quality printing result. In addition to reducing assembly steps using pre-applied tin, the phase change material stays solid at room temperature. This means particles or dust com contamination can be more easily brushed away. The pattern of the tin is important as well. We have de developed specific tin patterns for each power module housing. With this specific pattern, the tin thickness offers reduced thermal resistance with no need of retightened the screws after mounting at any time. All pre-applied modules come in ESD conforming blister packages with integrated protection for the pre-applied tin layer against the damage. And now I would like to share my research. Our high performance thermal paste or HPTP is our current benchmark in terms of maximum operating temperature and thermal performance. Since our current phase change materials are limited by either maximum temperature or thermal performance, there was a pressure to find an equivalent material to HPTP. So in 2019, we started a market study and discussed many different materials with phase change tin supplies. From this wells, six were shortlisted and investigated in more detail. In this presentation, I label them as TIM1 to TIM6, which will be compared to our reference phase change materials REF TIM8 and REF TIM9. TIM7 is HPTP and only sometimes used for a thermal comparison. Before putting too much effort into TIM testing with power modules, there are a number of preliminary tests for pre-selection. The focus on these following properties, the matrix and the filling material, the particle sizes and the distribution, the viscosity before and after curing, the temperature stability, the thermal conductivity, and last but not least, we need to perform printing trials with our application equipment. <clears throat> so let's start with the compound mixtures, mix, mixtures and the particles within the compounds. The particles within the compound can be made visible with a scanning electron microscope. The tin materials are filled with spherical particles, which are mostly aluminium. One exception is TIM3 with flake-like boron nitride particles. All sizes are somewhere between half a micron up to 10, 15 micron. A limitation of, the sm of a small bond line thickness by two large particles should therefore be excluded. The matrix in the compound mainly consists on paraffines, rubber resin mixtures, or mixtures containing silicone. <clears throat> then we measured all TIMs to their viscosity in an uncured state to find out if they have a reasonable shear rate 
to print these materials. The sheer red here can be considered as a scraper suite of the printing machine. At lower shear rates, our well-known reference material 8 and 9, forming the upper and the lower limits of the viscosity, and TIM 1 to TIM 6 are somewhere between. Based on the level achieved by existing TIMs, all have a typical viscosity within these boundaries. In another test, we investigated the wet TIM materials in a thermograph analysis, or short TGA, to see if the solvent is already evaporating at lower temperatures or only later. Therefore, a small probe is put under temperature and the mass loss is measured. Our REF TIM 9 is known as the faster drying phase change TIM, but TIM 5 and 6 dry even faster, which could lead into issues during printing. And, in fact, this turned out to be a problem later on. But after consulting the supplier, the proportion of the solvent could be increased and the issue fixed. The TGA method was also used to determine the thermal stability of the materials. Therefore, the temperature is increased to 125, 150 and 600 degrees. At 600 degrees, the matrix material in form of wax, rubbers or silicones should be fully evaporated. Then the filler content of the material can roughly be estimated. For a thermally stable material at 150 degrees, the mass loss should remain, remain low, which was not the case for REF TIM 8 and for TIM 3. Therefore, TIM 3 will not be further considered in later power cycle tests. Now uh, let's have a look to the dynamic mechanical analysis, or short DMA. The DMA analysis is used to investigate the viscosity or hardness of the material in a hot and cold state and to estimate the phase change temperature. Beside TIM4, all materials show a sharp transition between 30 and 50 degrees. The shear module can be seen here as a kind of a viscosity and the shear module of REF TIM 9 remains quite high compared to all other materials. This correlates to our experience with a bad distribution behavior in a hot state. All other materials are below TIM 9 and should therefore distrib uh, distribute better. <coughs> then, to assess the thermal performance of the material in more detail, we will examine the thermal conductivity according to ASTM standards in the next test. The setup includes two round plates pressed against each other and the tin probe between them. One plate is heated up, the other one cooled down. Then the temperature difference between these two round plates is measured. The smaller it is, the better since heat is conducted more effectively. Something special to mention here, the cooler temperature was set to 50 degrees to allow all tin materials to be viscous during the measurement. And here you can see the result. Compared to our reference TIM 8, the TIM material 6 offers the lowest delta T and thus the best RTH. Lastly, we perform printing trials with our series production equipment and machines. All materials could be well printed independent of the scraper speed up to 50 mm per second. None of the honeycombs are flowing out of shape and after the heat up process, uh, after the heat up process and after the material cools, all of them became rigid as expected. Now let's talk about the thermal resistance measurement under real condition. So for this thermal resistance measurement, a miniskip dual power module was used. There is an increased risk of cracking the ceramic during assembly of this module with a phase change term, so we currently have no plans to apply it in series for this module. However, for the thermal resistance measurement, this module provides quite accurate results to show between different TIMs. 
and in this test, RDH junction to heatsink and junction to ambient were measured. And here you can see the result. The reference TIM material 8 is our current standard phase change TIM, which already provides a huge benefit in RDH when compared to a standard grease. But compared to this reference, the TIM material 6 offers an additional large improvement in the thermal resistance of more than 20%. This TIM 6 is about as good as our HPTP, uh, which can be seen here as Ref TIM 7. And now coming to the last and from our point of view, most important evaluation, the power cycle test. A typical setup for power cycle test can be seen in the slide here. A power module is mounted on a cooler and the timeter is between. Then a high current is applied in form of a rectangular function, which causes an alternate heating and cooling of the base plate. Since the temperature rise follows the current with a delay, a sufficiently long-term switch-on time is required until the base plate is heated through. This heating and cooling forces an aging of the whole structure, including the tin material, similar to what happened in a real operation of an inverter. In addition to the solder layer and the bonding aging, the tin is also massively stressed, aged and possibly pumped out as we can see on the picture below. The load cycle charts here reflect the aging process as a rise in the chip temperature based on the number of load cycles. The typical aging process can be inferred from the shape of the increase. If there's a continuous increase from the start of the test, this indicates that the TIM is being pumped out as can be seen in the chart below. Base plate modules are more often affected than base plate less modules. If, on the other hand, the chip temperature remains on a stable level, this indicates much less de degradation of the tin material. Most of our TIMs were also subjected to, to such a power cycle test. So TIM 1, 2, 4 and 6 are uh, running alongside Side references 8 and 10. The module used for this test is a CMX3 press fit, a high volume industry standard package. Then all modules were applied with the same load. The module with our reference TIM material 8 was then set to 150 degree junction temperature, a delta T of 110 degree and a turn on time of 13 seconds. Furthermore, we have tested modules mounted in both vertical and horizontal orientation. After one module is end of life, it will be replaced by a new one. And to eliminate effects due to the module position on the cooler, the module position will be changed after end of life. And here you can see the chart with the achieved load cycles. Compared to our reference TIM material 8, TIM 6 performs the best and delivers about 30% more cycles. All other TIMs performs worse compared to the reference material. Now let's see how the RDH is affected by aging during the power cycling. Intermediate measurements were done at the beginning and after 10,000 cycles. The beginning means here after 100 cycles to enable an even distribution of the TIM layer. While TIM 1, 2 and 4 show a significant worsening in RTH related to pump out issues, TIM 6 show almost no change in RTH, even better than REF TIM 8. Thus, TIM 6 seems to be very stable and emerges as a clear winner in this test. Then, since we have tested in vertical and horizontal orientation, we expected differences in the cycles achieved. But this was not the case. No st statistically relevant correlation could be found between the mounting direction and the number of load cycles for TIM6.
As a last point of this topic, we can see the total number of load cycles reached by each TIM. TIMs with a poor RTH typically also achieve a low number of cycles, but even materials with a good initial RTH can degrade so quickly, resulting in a shorter lifetime, as can be seen in the example of TIM4. So TIM6 emerges once again as a clear winner from this test with more than 30k cycles. That is around 25% more compared to our reference TIM material 8 and more than doubled compared to a standard grease. Now after the investigation have been completed, it is a matter of defining a target variant to be qualified. Based on the results of the previous tests regarding material characteristics, thermal performance, reliability and lifetime, and high temperature stability, TIM6 performed the best overall. So we will move forward to qualify the TIM material 6. In the qualification process, the material is subjected to, such, uh, to tests according to standards like high and low temperature storage, storage under humidity, climatic change, and thermal cycling. The pass criteria is that after the storage test, the RDH will not change significantly. And the target of the standard test procedure is to ensure the shelf life of the pre-applied modules within the closed packaging first, and second, the long-term reliability in the application. So Tim 6 successfully passed all of these tests. <clears throat> so let's wrap up all the results and make a conclusion. All in all, we spent two years of investigation from initial market study to the release of a new phase change thermal interface material. We did thousands of hours of various tests and a new state-of-the-art TIM material has been fully qualified. We now call the TIM material 6 as the High Performance Phase Change Material, or short HPPCM, with first samples on our modules in Q1 2022. For our users, the benefit include a lower RDH, which can be used to increase the inverter output power, or alternatively, an inverter lifetime increase by 30% at the same load. And of course, a combination of higher inverter power and longer lifetime is also possible. At the end, it's a huge performance boost for minimal cost. Semicron will gradually expand its portfolio and offers this new TIM option on a broad module portfolio. In order to reduce the effort and the complexity of our customers' manufacturing lines, Semicron offers pre-applied TIM both phase change material and paste. Our goal is to make manufacturing as easy as possible for you. We select the perfect material for your product. We make sure that we apply the right thickness and the right pin pattern for the modules. Our printing process is fully automated and the process controlled which all leads to cost-optimized solution because you no longer have to spend this effort. For more information, please contact us. Thank you very much, Stefan, for the, uh, for the great presentation. And I am sharing the PDF version of this webinar right now. All right, you should have it for download. And I guess we have a couple questions that we can go through, not too many here. So um, the first question I have is, what kind of a cost adder would it be for, uh, the, for the phase change material if we pre-apply it? And I'll, I'll add to that and say, how does that compare with other materials? Yeah, in principle, phase change materials are more, ex or pre-applied phase change materials are more expensive compared to pre-applied creases. The reason is uh, simply the additional process we have in-house. Um, but we expect uh, from cost range of, uh, point of view, a similar 
similar costs for the HP PCM, like our standard phase change materials we are running today, so HALA P8 or HALA HD. Okay, okay. So so not too much more expensive, something in the range of like a euro? Yeah, half a euro until four, two, three, four euro for the large modules, I would say. Okay, for the big stuff. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get this question right. Um, so you were talking about the, the filling degree um, and you'd mentioned that, that there's a high filling degree for the, for the phase change material here. Um, what is that, that filling degree and how does it compare to, to other materials? Yeah, the filling degree really plays uh, um, an important role. So our HPTP is, is also filled with 92%, so it's quite a lot. But the HP PCM is even higher with 95%. Still, we measured with our uh, TGA method. Okay. And then um, let's see. you had not mentioned anything about thermal conductivity itself of the, of the phase change material. Is there any reason for that? Yeah, in principle, I do not like uh, any discussion about thermal conductivity. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let, let me explain this way. The thermal conductivity of HP PCM is high, yes, but even a high value is stated in the data sheet. The performance uh, of the compound mainly depends on two factors. The ability to establish thin layers is the first point, and the second one, the contact uh, or to contact the or to have a good contact between the material and the surface. Um, we very often had the case that we had a material with a high thermal conductivity, but even said we just reached a very bad uh, thermal resistance at the end. So evaluating a TIM by thermal conductivity is, is uh, from my perspective, the wrong way. Okay. Uh, wow, there's a few things coming in at once. I have to get through it here. Um, I have a question here. It's about the, the pump out effects. Um, why does the base plate module not have the same or have more of a pump out effect than the base plate less modules? The cup and the base plate module is so thin that uh, you don't uh, have the same expansion in the dimension that you would have in a larger piece. Okay. Um, so it's about the thermal co uh, coefficients, this expansion and contraction. So it, it pushes it out more, I guess. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm kind of reading through these. They're not always marked as questions. Um, there was, let's see, there's a question about base plate list modules using phase change materials. You said the mini skip, uh, I'm kind of going off the question here. The mini skip is not really well suited for the phase change material. Is that all base plate modules or, or what's the what's the deal there? Yeah, in, <clears throat> in principle, we follow the strategy to apply a phase change material on a base plate modules on you, uh, only. The reason is that base plate less modules um, are quite sensitive against cracks. And uh, as soon as you apply a, a, a stiff or hard material between the module and the heatsink, the, the risk of cracking the ceramic during assembly is quite high. An exception here is our semitop E, um, where we apply a, um, a phase change material because the module is, is simply able to, to handle it. Okay. Um, so basically, we typically don't do it with base plate, or base plate less, except the semitop E1 exactly, and E2. Exactly. Okay. Um, and then I'll say there's one more question I'll ask. Uh, I'm not finding the question so easy, so here's the last one. Um, will the module data sheets be updated with the with the TIM6 that we have with the high performance phase change material once it's out? At the end, clear, yes, we will update the data sheet. In which way, it's not yet clear. So uh, if we remove old values and just uh, place the, the new values there, or if we have an additional line with a new RTH, this needs to be discussed and uh, de decided later on. Okay. Oh, and then let's see, I have one here that's kind of twice asked, and I, I'll call this one the last one. Sorry about that. Um, so the, I'm trying to phrase this right, 
the shelf life of the pre-applied tim um i guess there's some question about how long is that in you know is that stated somewhere at the end, we will also create a data sheet for the uh, high performance phase change material. And uh, typically, we state in our data sheets the shelf life uh, which needs to be considered. Our goal for the HPPCM will be to um, have a longer shelf life compared to other materials. Means at the end, we have more than one year. Our goal is to have two years of shelf life under typical 1K2 conditions, let me say. Okay, so two years under typical 1K2 conditions. Mm -hmm. That's the goal, at least. Um, okay, well, I'll call that it for the questions for the time being. Stefan, thank you very much again. Uh, to the audience, thank you for joining the webinar today. I hope you enjoyed it and you could take away some, some useful information. Um, please join us for future webinars and have a great day. Bye-bye.